Hello, welcome to today's program. I'm Peter Afrasiabi. I'm a partner at the law firm of One LLP, and I teach at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. But please note, all the views expressed today in today's program about biased judges, bad lawyering, all of these issues that we discuss, those are just my views. They don't belong to any of the institutions that I may work for. So let's get going today in today's program. This is specialty bias credit for you. And we're going to be talking about bias in the realm of judges in terms of when we have a biased judge and in terms of what we do to deal with those biased judges. And of course, we're going to look at the dangers of charging bias if you don't have a good basis for it, which brings us to the issue we discussed today with respect to bad lawyering. So let's get going and take a look on the first slide at the issues we're going to discuss today. One of the big picture issues we confront is that charging bias against a judge creates a dilemma for you, the practitioner. If you find yourself in a possible situation of disqualification, DQ, to DQ a judge for bias, you have to understand the standard that applies and you have to understand the standard that you will be assessed by when you make that charge. And so you may see something that you believe is bias and the questions that we have to analyze and assess are, is it in fact bias or is it not bias? Do you charge it? Do you not charge it? What are the risks for charging it? Can this be a boomerang for you as a lawyer? Now the other side of this coin, of course, is who judges the judge in the bias charge? Does the judge who you feel is biased get to determine his or her own bias or does it go to another judge? And these are some of the procedural questions that we'll also look at. And fundamentally, the question we're looking at that's the big picture question when we're talking about bias with respect to judges and judicial decision making is a dilemma for all of us, for lawyers, for judges, for legislatures, for, the, for clients, for the parties, for the entire body politic. It's a dilemma for everyone as, as noted here. And that is, when would a reasonable observer fairly conclude that the judge's impartiality can be in question? And that governing standard is really important to maintain integrity in the judicial system. So those are the issues that kind of frame what we're looking at today. And let's get going. As an overview of where we're going today, you can see here on the slide that we'll be looking at the federal bias standards overview. We're focusing here, of course, on federal law and, and the laws that apply in federal court. They're very, very similar to most states, but every state is going to be a little different. And the federal standards are the generally applicable standards across all 50 states. And so we'll be using those. And we'll be looking at the substantive standards themselves, as well as, as we've referenced, the procedural issues that ex exist here. And so there are five common scenarios that sort of exist that you can group bias issues into involving judges. And these five are when you have a judge with a prior relationship with parties, when you have a judge who have a, may, may have a prior relationship with a witness, when you have a judge, of course, who could have a prior relationship with a lawyer or an existing relationship with one of the lawyers appearing before him, when you have a judge who's engaged in public commentary on issues that perhaps are now being tried before that judge in the judge's court. And we're going to look finally at the lawyer and legal behavior from lawyers that may engender judicial animus and how that can either trigger or not trigger a basis for bias. We will also look, as well as those five um, kind of buckets of, of bias related issues, we're going to look at bias in the realm of race and race oriented bias charges against judges and this line between race bias by the judge and or race bias by a lawyer in charging race bias against the judge. And in all of this, we're gonna look at a historical case of interest involving a bias charge brought by a lawyer against a judge and the resulting explosive fallout from that case from history where ultimately the lawyer spent some time in jail for his improper behavior um, and tripping those lines and calling bias when he shouldn't have. So let's get going and look at the first federal statute. And this is 28 USC section 455. And this bias issue revolves around a, the, you know, the major rule being that a judge will be disqualified for the appearance of partiality as viewed from the perspective of a reasonable, thoughtful person. And that reasonable, thoughtful person is your average lay person, not a judge. And so what a reasonable judge may think is biased or not is too high a standard. And so the statute 
requires disqualification for this bias where, quote, impartiality might reasonably be questioned, end quote. Now, this serves a couple of masters. There's the public policy perception in terms of protecting the public and the public's perception that the administration of justice is occurring fairly. And it also requires a perception and a focus on outward facts that could be construed as bias which itself avoids the need for a subjective inquiry. And the major fault line here is that the facts need to be objective facts to which a reasonable, thoughtful observer would think that judge has bias. They can't be a set of facts which don't meet an objective standard and instead require a look into the heart and mind of the judge, what would you, you would call a subjective, <clears throat> a subjective test. And the policy, as you can imagine, is obviously the case that, you know, ass asserting the claim that a judge is subjectively biased against you because you know from something what the judge is thinking or feeling, and then you want to test what the judge is thinking or feeling by perhaps deposing your judge, it's never going to happen. And so the test has been established as an objective one to avoid, you know, having to lift, lift the, the lid to that, to that Pandora's box of getting into the judge's mind or head. Now, the bias and prejudice, as you see here, has to stem from extrajudicial sources. And so what this really means is that it needs to come from somewhere outside the record. Um, it can't come from something intrinsic to your case, i.e., you know, the, the judge doesn't like your litigation strategy, and so therefore he's biased and can be disqualified. It re really requires almost all of the time some extra record source of bias because of relationships or comments or, or whatnot that we'll look at. The law also says, and this is generally true across all circuits, that if there are close questions on a bias and disqualification bid, we err on the side of disqualifying. And that's in order to serve that public perception policy that's so important that the public perceive and understand and believe that courts are functioning in a fair above board manner. So practical tips, you need to have sufficient cause to levy the charge, and that's what we'll be looking at today. And so a lot of these tests, as you can imagine, are pretty high. They're not, it's not an easy standard to meet to bounce a judge for being biased against you. And of course, that triggers a massive practical strategic question that you as a litigator, you as a lawyer for your client in your case have to think about, and that is, if you charge too easily or too quickly or without a sufficient basis, you now have potential blowback. You have a judge who you've accused of bias and you may have lost your bid and that judge could now be upset with you. You may fundamentally fear the judge is upset with you and you'll never know one way or the other. One would hope the judge would be able to put that aside and not harbor animus towards you, but your client will never understand that even if you as a lawyer believe that the judge can be that way and even if you and the judge both independently know that that's what's going on. Your client will second guess you and feel that my goodness, you charged that judge with bias, you lost, and then when you lose the next motion, the client's going to think that you've messed up the case, right? So that kind of practical blowback, which can lead to clients not paying bills, obviously, leaving and getting a new lawyer, being frustrated, denigrating you, and worse, complaining to the state bar or suing you for malpractice. I mean, all of those things are the pitfalls that can come in this boomerang if you hurl it out you know, you better, be, you better make sure you're throwing a stick and not a boomerang, in other words, because you don't want this to come back and bite you. Let's go to the next statute, and that's 28 U.S.C. 144, and it's very similar. Um, this statute requires that if you want to charge bias, you have to swear out an affidavit that the judge, quote, has a personal bias or prejudice either against you, you the affiant, or in favor of an adverse party. The standard is the same objective standard from section 455. It's just a different litmus test in the sense that you procedurally approach this with your affidavit you've sworn out and you explain it. Um, but it's the same basic um, approach and standard. And you can see here a quote from the US Supreme Court case of the governing extrajudicial source um, standard. And so here's the quote. The judge who presides at a trial may, upon completion of the evidence, be exceedingly ill disposed towards the defendant who has been shown to be a thoroughly reprehensible person. But the judge is not thereby recusable for bias or prejudice, since his knowledge and the opinion it produced were properly and necessarily acquired in the course of the proceedings, and are indeed sometimes, as in a bench trial, necessary to completion of the judge's task. So that comes from Latecki versus United States in Supreme Court case in 1994, 
And what it's making clear then is obviously that there has to be an extra judicial source of the bias. You can't be you know, a criminal defendant, have done a lot of bad things, have been convicted of doing a lot of bad things, and then say, oh, the judge doesn't like me because I got convicted by a jury of doing bad things and I'm a bad guy and the judge doesn't like bad guys, right? That type of thing. Not enough. It's got to be an extra judicial source. Now, here's a practice tip. If you're going to move under one statute, move under both. There's no reason to move only under one, and there's a lot of benefit, benefit to moving under both just in case you hit some pitfall on one, you want the benefit of the other one and you want to have both preserved as a basis for appeal, for example, if you may have an appeal. Now let's flip um, to the other side, and this is looking at the Code of Judicial Conduct. And so we see here the Code of Conduct of United States Judges, and this is Canon number 2A. And Canon 2A says that a judge has to, quote, act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary, end quote. The judge has to, quote, avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety in all activities, end quote. And so that again is a reminder that the judges are subjected to this canon of not just avoiding impropriety, but avoiding what could even be reasonably construed as being the appearance of impropriety. And so as you can imagine, you know, if the line is just actual impropriety, that's a line that you would fence in around yourself somewhere, wherever that is. But if it's even the appearance of impropriety, that's pushing the line out even further. And so what, what we now have is this idea that there's a massive buffer zone between the judge and what the judge may or may not do in order to maintain public confidence in the judiciary. And so this code of conduct that applies to our federal judges, including magistrate judges, um, sits along with those US federal codes that we've already quoted in terms of defining the playing field, in terms of what's expected in terms of a judge when, when it comes to issues of bias and recusal. Now, let's look briefly at this procedural question of who judges the judge. We can start with the premise of the law from, from Blackstone, and this sort of is a way to drop in here at 50,000 feet into what we're talking about. And Blackstone says, quote, the law will not suppose a possibility of bias or favor in a judge who is already sworn to administer impartial justice and whose authority greatly depends upon that presumption and idea, end quote. And so what we have here is this really important idea that judges are sworn to be impartial. And in light of that, the absolute default presumption and, and assumption is that they are in fact impartial. And we can't have a presumption or even a low level standard of uh, charging a judge with being biased because that itself triggers problems, if you think about it, systemic problems with the validity of the entire system. I mean, if it were the case that a judge sworn to be impartial is presumed to be impartial at the, at the slightest, not impartial, I mean, at the slightest charge or whim, then what we're really saying is that, that our judicial system, this third branch of government, really isn't functioning as a neutral and impar impartial um, dispenser of justice. And whatever one may believe politically about, about that and wherever you may fall, at the end of the day, um, just the political reality of it is that the system has to adopt and, and follow that, um, that poll star. And so that poll star sort of sets the stage in terms of what we're looking at then when it comes to these charges. And that then raises the question of, okay, if you're going to make a charge, who judges it? Well, on the state side at least, there's a difference of opinion. Um, you know, you know, states will differ. Most states require that if you charge one judge with bias, it goes to another judge and that other judge will then assess it objectively, applying the governing standard and then make the decision and send it back or send it to a new judge, whatever may the case may be. But not all states do that. In some states, you know, the judge can actually assess um, the, the bias question being brought against you know, him or herself um, and charge it, decide it herself. The general federal standard and, and the proper practice in federal court is that when these motions are brought under those statutes for, for bias against a judge, it's handed off to another judge in the district and that other judge will then um, you know, you know, analyze the papers, hold oral argument, do whatever they do, take testimony, take evidence, and then decide that question in order to maintain the appearance of impartiality because of the very question that gets raised by a judge being charged with something and then being able to decide whether he did it or didn't do it. Um, and so we outsource it to another judge to remove even that wrinkle of appearance of impartiality that could creep into the analysis. Now, the twin pole stars here 
um, and these overarching policies we have to keep in mind on both sides of the bench, the judicial side and the, the lawyer public side, is that public confidence requires a judge to not just be neutral, but to all also be perceived to be neutral, and that echoes what we already talked about. And we also, though, have this idea that the system cannot be subjected to abusive attacks as a means of exploiting this impartiality requirement. And those two governing poll stars are really, really, really important. This idea that we want our judges to be neutral and perceived to be neutral, but at the same time, lawyers can't tactically abuse the judiciary and the, the judicial system by making charges against judges for bias that may be unfounded. And those explosive um, poll stars, for example, can come into tension. And gravity, you know, you know, the magnetic north and south can get out of whack here when you have heightened emotional cases and charges may get made too soon or maybe not too soon and judges are upset, parties are upset. And those explosive cases make for great fodder for us to analyze these legal questions. And so we're going to start with one of those explosive cases, as you see here on our next slide, and this is going to take us back to the Cold War. And this comes from San Francisco in the 1930s, and this is the sort of the, the story of the Harry Bridges deportation saga and judicial bias. And spoiler alert, I wrote a book on this called Burning Bridges, America's Crusade to Deport, 20-Year Crusade to Deport Labor Leader Harry Bridges. And it's a fascinating story, really, a, a true story about a 20-year deportation saga against Harry Bridges. And you'll learn a little bit of it right now as backdrop to our bias question. But one of the, in one of the trials that occurred, there was a bias charge. And that's the Petri dish that we're going to look at today. So if, just to give you some overview, let's go back to the 1930s. It's 1934, San Francisco. It's the Great Depression. There's massive social angst over the Great Depression, social uprising, upheaval problems, and all the economic changes that were occurring, and you know, massive problems with labor, wanting to unionize and have more rights, and this is sort of just generally an explosive social setting. And at the same time, the ism of that period was communism, and there was great public fear about communism, a red revolution, and the like. And our stage then is set in the early 1930s. Um, we're in the Great Depression in San Francisco, and a longshoreman there, Harry Bridges, who had come from Australia and was just a working longshoreman, starts speaking publicly about the need to have a real union that's not a sellout union to management, that's not in cahoots with management in this kind of conflicted situation. And he starts speaking loudly and passionately to have real labor rights. <clears throat> and he really rises out of the mists of, of longshoremen on, on the shores of San Francisco and becomes a, you know, a, a vocal, radical, um, labor leader. And he doesn't have a position of power yet, but people start listening to him. And so he then starts calling for a full strike. And eventually he leads a full-blown West Coast strike in the United States, which, which was the first general strike in American history that literally shut down all the ports on the West Coast for shipping because all the longshoremen along the West Coast went on strike following Harry Bridges' demands to sort of have this strike to provoke social change about the balance of power between um, labor and management. And so he leads this strike and then, you know, it becomes a, becomes bloody. There's this infamous Bloody Thursday where some where the police kill some of the striking longshoremen. There's literally um, grenades and, and bullets being shot and grenades thrown and battles on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. It's literally a war zone. And, you know, eventually the dust settles and what comes out of it is a negotiated deal with Harry Bridges now running the Longshoremen Union on the West Coast. And, and this deal was sort of negotiated and bridged by the federal government that came in to restore peace. And so he's now in a position of power running this union and he's an important guy. And immediately though, what happened is the cry went up that he was a communist and he was a member of the Communist Party. And at the time under American deportation law, you could be deported if you were a member of the Communist Party. And so this then triggers what is a 20 year legal saga with four different legal trials, including, you know, quote unquote, you know, informal trials before Congress, but four actual court trials trying to deport him and jail him for membership in a Communist Party. And so it starts in the mid 30s and it doesn't end until the mid 1950s when we are obviously in another Red Scare or a continue, continuation of this Red Scare. In any event, just as background, he goes to his first trial, which is an, an immigration trial, and you know the government, it's a multi-month trial, the government puts on loads of witnesses, and the trial examiner concludes that there's no evidence he's a member of the Communist Party, and, and it's got some of the most remarkable 
moments of cross-examination and witnesses, you know, being destroyed on the witness stand, amazing lawyering, unbelievable, you know, corruption, and it, the whole story is told in the book. And so he wins. And so Congress immediately reacts by, you know, passing new immigration laws. And actually, many, many congressmen spoke about the need to amend the immigration laws just to get Harry Bridges. And so they create new immigration laws so they can deport him and other communists again, because this is part of the larger mosaic of communist deportation trials. And there's a second trial. And in the second trial, um, the Department of Justice handpicks a different trial examiner. This time, you know, you know, even though the trial examiner founds, finds again that government witnesses are perjuring themselves and lying, nonetheless, you know, convicts and orders him deported. This then goes up on appeal and through a great bunch of, um, you know, amazing legal hoopla ends up before the Supreme Court, which finds his conviction basically shockingly unconstitutional and, and depraved, really, in terms of the denial of due process and vacates his conviction and says, no, he can't be um, deported on this basis. There's no evidence for it. He has the right to swear in as a citizen. And so Harry Bridges then, and this is what's really important for, our, for getting to our bias case now, Harry Bridges goes and he swears in as a citizen. And at the time, the oath to swear in as a citizen required one to hold up their hand and you know, swear to defend the Constitution, blah, 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 and to swear that you're not a member of the Communist Party. And so he makes that oath, having now won two cases. And at that point, the Department of Justice decides to indict him on criminal charges to put him in prison and then deport him for perjury in his naturalization application, i.e., when he swore that he wasn't a member of the Communist Party, he really was. And so this then provokes a third trial, which is now a criminal trial in, in San Francisco. And this is where we are now brought, as you can see on the next slide, and by now we're in 1950, 1949, 1950, and we have this third trial in San Francisco. And there's a photograph of Vince Hallinan, and he's the defense lawyer for Harry Bridges. And his basic thesis walking into the case is that you know, there's been a proven conspiracy to, between government officials and private officials to frame Harry Bridges. It's been proven and adopted by the Supreme Court and by the trial examiners who have heard the prior two cases. And this whole case is basically a fraud, and I'm going to prove it. And so Hallinan, um, who was a famous San Francisco lawyer of the time, I mean, um, ran on the progressive ticket actually at one point, and, and as a, an interesting footnote to history, the first female vice presidential candidate in American history was his um, vice presidential candidate who ran with him on the progressive ticket, and he obviously lost. But in any event, at this time, he's you know, there in, tr in trial representing Harry Bridges, and he does his opening statement. In his opening statement, he starts talking about how the government's witnesses, I'm going to prove they're perjurers and they're liars. I mean, it's just not true what they're saying, and I'm going to prove it. And the government objects, and the judge slams him for you know, insulting witnesses who are coming and calling him perjurers when, when there's no proof they're perjurers, um, and shuts him down on that. And he proceeds to talk in opening statement about um, how this is a conspiracy, and the judge shuts him down on that. And so his, by the time he's done with his opening statement, it's really remarkable when you read these ancient transcripts, but I mean, it reads anything like a modern day opening statement. I mean, it, it's, it reads like a deposition transcript where every few sentences there's objections and the judge talks, the lawyer, the government lawyers talk, and then he goes back to his opening, more objections. It's just this endless litany of objections and rulings. And so in any event, he gets to his first witness and he starts with the same thing on cross-examination about the witness um, in terms of the witness, you know, being aware of these prior rulings and the fraudulent nature of what's going on. And the judge then shuts him down again. And the judge then comes out on the bench on the next day and, you know, the next day of trial um, having and says, you know, this is, this behavior by you is outrageous. I'm holding you in contempt. I'm going to send you to jail and I'm going to kick you out of the trial. You don't get to represent Harry Bridges. You know, you're accusing all these nice witnesses. You know, literally the quote was like, he's a mild mannered government official. You know, you can't accuse these people of bad things like that. You have no proof of it, blah, blah, blah. And so he's now held in contempt. He's upset. And he charges the judge with bias on the spot. And he's literally holding onto the podium as the U.S. Marshals are there to drag him out of the court. Uh, meanwhile, the criminal defendant, Harry Bridges, is sitting there saying, what about me? I need a lawyer. Well, but that's a different story. Um, and so let's now look at the next page because um, Vince Hallinan makes a bias charge, and his bias charge is sort of two-pronged. And let's look at it so that we can analyze this issue of bias in terms of bias from within the trial record, but also bias from an extrajudicial source. And Hallinan tells the judge, you're biased against me. You're, you know, on the one hand, he says, you're clearly favoring the government, 
Um, you're kind of in league with this idea that my trial should be circumscribed. You don't believe that the government's done all this bad stuff to Harry Bridges, and so you're not letting me put on a proper trial. You're curtailing my opening. You're curtailing my witness. You're, you're basically curtailing my defense, and you are not allowing me to make the defense I want to make, and that's bias. And that's an intra-record charge of bias, obviously, right? And that raises the question of, you know, if you don't like the judge's rulings, you know, what is the remedy? What do you do as a lawyer? Do you run all over them? Do you charge bias? Or are you forced just to accept the judge's rulings and take it up on appeal? Is that your remedy? And that's what we're looking at on the one hand. But on the other hand, we're also looking at an extra-record bias charge that Hallinan brings up to the judge because Apparently, as you can see here from the ancient affidavit um, that came, comes out of the National Archives, and all these documents that you see come from the National Archives where I got them. Um, and here we have the affidavit that Hallinan swore out against the judge, um, in his, ultimately in his motion. <clears throat> he says, the judge, and the judge is George Harris. George Harris stated that he was about to find Hallinan in contempt of court. Hallinan arose and charged the court with acting towards him upon the premise of a personal bitterness or hatred outside the record. And this is it, and here you see. Hallinan states as follows, that D Judge Harris was and is a personal friend of a third party, Eugene Oregi. And Oregi is a conceited enemy of Hallinan. And Hallinan then st states that George Harris took Oregi's part in a controversy in the past that was between Oregi and Hallinan. And basically, Oregi sued Hallinan saying, Hallinan owes me money. Hallinan said, I don't owe you money. And Oregi sues Hallinan in court. And what Hallinan said happened is that he one day got called into Judge Harris's chambers. This is when Harris was a state court judge. And Judge Harris pressured him to just let it go and pay Oregi the $10,000 he owed. And Hallinan basically said, hell no, I'm not paying the guy any money. I don't owe him any money. And how dare you pressure me to try to like, you know, you know settle, this, settle this case because he's a friend of yours and you're a judge and I may be here, right? That's Hallinan's story. Hallinan went to trial and actually won the case. In any event, Helen now says, ever since then, there's this, been this personal enmity between us. I mean, you picked that other guy's side and you tried to pressure me, and so you hate me, and so I'm saying you're biased on that basis. And so he makes that charge also, and that's an extra record charge. And so the question we now have to ask, and this is question one on this slide, is, you know, was it proper? We have facts of a bias that have been offered, and the question, of course, under the, the governing federal standards that were the same then as now, is could a reasonable observer think that Judge Harris was biased based on those facts? And the answer is yes. One could, I think, based on those facts, think that Judge Harris is biased on the extrajudicial facts. It's not a slam dunk, but one could certainly harbor the belief that this judge may have lost the ability to be neutral or that there could be a perception of a lack of neutrality based upon those facts that, that Hallinan offered in terms of the, the prior relationship and the problems. And the facts were pretty concrete. They weren't just highly speculative, i.e., the judge doesn't like me because I wear a red tie or whatever it may be, right? Um, and so there probably is a decent factual basis to make a charge of bias. So our next slide you can see is question two. We've learned what the judge did do. Now the question we have to ask ourselves when we're doing this bias analysis is what should the judge have done? And so remember, we have this twofold set of facts, intra and extra record facts. You've got the Oregi story, which is outside the record, and you've got the in-record facts. And the important thing about the in-record facts, and this is the important rule of law that's, that's true that we have to be aware of, and that is a lawyer's belief that his case is being unfairly limited is not enough alone to show bias. Lawyers caught in the angst of times and high emotion of, of famous cases, you know, of that day and this day, whatever they may be, is not enough to sort of create a basis for bias and a bias claim. Um, however, you know, you know, tying the alleged prior comment of, of ethics violations, you know, may or may not be appropriate, um, but those could be extra record facts. And so the, the line here that's important to keep in mind is that we have an obligation to our client. And there's this line between zealous representation that Hallinan was engaged in and damaging the case just because you want to infuriate the judge. And so now let's go to the next slide and go back to our historical records and look at what did this judge do as opposed to what he should have done. Here's the judge's comments. I think in your own heart, your own conscience, as you stand there, you know, Mr. Hallinan, everything you've said this morning is false, untrue, unfair, and scurrilous. Man to man, in an alley or in a courtroom, you couldn't look me in the eye and say that. 
And that's the judge speaking to Hallinan. This is how rattled the judge now is. Hallinan says, let me put it, let me file an affidavit making the charge and you charge me with perjury, sir. You will not file the affidavit. Then we will try it out. You will not file any affidavit before me, Mr. Vince Hallinan. And as we go to the continued script on the next slide here, Hallinan responds to the judge, well, I will file it with the clerk upstairs, your honor. I'm entitled to my rights in this court too. And I'm entitled to not be tried by a personal enemy on a contempt proceeding. Judge Hallinan says it will be stricken from the files. And indeed it was. And Hallinan's motion was then denied. The judge though now is so rattled and so upset that you actually have the judge and on the next slide you can see musing on the record saying, talking in the first person about himself to the lawyer saying, I suppose I am rather peculiar sort of fellow. I can't harbor malice. I can't ha harbor the subject matter that Mr. Hallinan poured into this court today. All his statements, all those things are untrue. He knew it. If Mr. Gladstein were available, I assume there'd be no problem. He's represented this man, Harry Bridges, in other matters, two in number. And what the judge is referring to is that in the first two trials, Harry Bridges' lawyer was Gladstein. And the judge is frustrated because he doesn't want Hallinan. And he's saying, why can't Gladstein come represent Bridges, which he actually said, and to which he was informed. <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. Gladstein was not there in that trial because he was in jail for contempt of court in another communist deportation trial back east. And it just seemed in that time period, lawyers defending communists found themselves in contempt and thrown in jail regularly. Um, and so Hallinan was there instead of him. And so now we can look and see, you know, what did the judge then do? Well, he didn't recuse himself. He didn't accept the bias charge and he decided it himself. That one, it wasn't sent to another judge. And he sent Hallinan to jail for six months for contempt of court. And he just did it on the bench without even a notice in a hearing um, as all of that melee that I referred to was unfolding. Um, <clears throat> but it did raise the issue of, you know, what about um, Harry Bridges having a defense? And so the judge eventually turned to Harry Bridges when he couldn't get Gladstein to come rep represent him and say, you know, what do you want me to do? And Harry Bridges smartly said, well, I like Vince Hallinan. I want him as my lawyer. So the judge sustained the six-month sentence until the end of the case. Um, the case went on for multiple months in federal court in San Francisco, the longest federal criminal trial at the time. And the jury convicted Harry Bridges, um, at which point Harry Bridges was sentenced to jail, but that got stayed pending appeal. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vince Hallinan, he got sent to jail. Um, and off he went. And then you can see here on the next slide, just as an interesting postscript, the judge's statement to the jury after they convicted Harry Bridges. And you see down there at the bottom that he commends the jury on their brilliant work, um, where he says in those last two lines, you finally found the golden truths shimmering in the fiery crucibles of this trial. Um, you know, which I think probably is almost a testament to the inherent bias of the judge in that case at that point. But in any event, um, we, we look at the question is, what should Hallinan have done on the, next slide, <clears throat> on the next slide? Did he go too far or did he not? And these are difficult questions in areas of law that are filled with emotion, right? And at that time it was communism, communi communist deportation, but today it's terrorism trials or people accused of terrorism or you know, other areas of law that are very sort of politicized, for lack of a better word, or very emotional because of the nature of the underlying policy that may be at work in the law. Um, and those can trigger you know, courts and lawyers to get them to, to, to go too far. And so I think on that one, Hallinan's conviction was ultimately affirmed by the Ninth Circuit in terms of um, his, his breach. And the ultimate conclusion was that, you know, the, the venom he kind of poured in in the, in the case and then there was a whole bunch of stuff that happened in the, throughout the trial as he battled with the judge. I mean, it was just a, a slugfest for months. The court, the Ninth Circuit basically kind of intimated that maybe Judge Harris went a little too far, but just sort of rubber stamped it and left it alone. Um, and there you can see the postscript. And just as a postscript for Harry Bridges, this went all the way up to the Supreme Court again. And stunningly, they took his case for the second time and they reversed it again, basically saying that this is another unconstitutional <laughs> trial. Um, meanwhile, the lawyer served his sentence. So this now gets us to federal court today. And let's you know, shift from that Petri dish to, to some questions that we look at today in federal court in terms of bias charges that are made. And we're gonna look at these common scenarios that we've talked about in terms of the judge's relationships with parties, with witnesses, with lawyers, um, with, with the issues being tried before the judge and the, the lawyer's behavior. And then of course, we're gonna look at some bias in the realm of race. <clears throat> so let's take the first scenario. And this is the judge's prior relationship with parties, you know, and, and with um, 
you know, experiential situational connections to, for, for example, the subject matter being tried, where the judge has got a particularly personal or shared experiential experience, so, you know, um, if I can say that, um, with the issue. And so here's the general rule. The general rule is that a prior relationship may allow a judge to be disqualified for bias, but it rarely compels it. Acquaintances alone is not enough, but if the relationship is really too friendly or antagonistic, then yes, bias can be found. And as a general matter, shared belief systems, you know, that shared experiential experience with, with the issues or parties in the case is just not enough at the general level. And so we're going to look at three cases here. Uh, as, as we sort of unpackage this. We're going to look, the first one is Bryce versus Episcopal Church, and this deals with the judge being of the same religion as the defendants in a case where the religion and the tenets of the religion are sort of centrally at issue in the case. The second case is going to look at similar shaping experiences, and we're going to look at this example from this, um, this case coming out of the Eighth Circuit where you have a criminal prosecution of someone for sexually abusing a child and the judge had publicly, you know, the judge had been a sexual abuse victim survivor himself and that was just sort of publicly, publicly known and so it's in the public record. And whether that shared experiential experience could, would it render the judge being incapable, being um, biased or fair towards a defendant being charged with similar conduct. And then finally we're going to look at United States versus Tuhi. This is coming out of the Second Circuit um, and we'll be looking at the sort of the judge's relationship to, um, to witnesses um, in the case. And so let's turn to the first one. Let's go to and the first one is Bryce versus Episcopal Church. And this is 289 F3rd 648 coming out of the Tenth Circuit. And we're looking at the issue of whether a similar religion to heated case issue is enough to require and justify a finding of bias by the judge. And so let's talk about this case briefly. The case involves the plaintiffs Leanne Bryce and Reverend Sarah Smith and they bring a sexual harassment suit against St. Aidan's Episcopal Church and they brought it based upon remarks made by the church about homosexuals and about the plaintiffs homosexual activities and the church then asserted a First Amendment defense saying that you know you can't sue us for sexual harassment because our remarks about homosexuality are part of our ecclesiastical discussions on church policy and that's just very protected First Amendment freedom of religion speech um, material. And so the church, you know, has, if the church has a bias towards homosexuality or is anti-homosexual, that's our right as our church within our church doctrine and you can't sue us for that. And that's the general issue that's pending in their suit. Well, the judge in the case was a member of an Episcopal church. It was a different Episcopal church in a different state. Um, but this dispute obviously involved the, the American Episcopal Church and, a, and, and some doctrinal battle going on in terms of the church at that time period. Remember, this goes back to the late 90s, early 2000s um, in terms of its stance on homosexuality. And, and so the court then dealt with this issue and said, you know, other than him being a member of an, an Episcopal Church, an Episcopalian in a different state, there's just no note of bias. There's no connection of him to these parties, to that church, to even his position, belief, leaning statements about, about that doctrine. Um, it's in a, he's in a different state, frankly, to where this whole battle was even going on. Um, and so the court then concluded that, you know, just because he may have the same mass, at a, at a massive level, you know, associational belief system, he's in a, an Episcopal, he's a, um, you know, a Catholic, whatever that label may be, that's not enough to trigger a bias charge against a judge for being incapable of being neutral in adjudicating a dispute that may involve this underlying ecclesiastical battle. And it was just too tenuous. And so the court said no, no basis of bias there. So we shift from that now to um, an, another case which is similar. Um, it's not associational bias because of it being a member of an organization, but it's associational bias in the sense that it's situationally similar from uh, a similar experiential background. <clears throat> and this is Mann versus the Lacker at 246 F3rd 1092 coming out of the Eighth Circuit in 2001. And so the underlying facts in this case are as follows. And the underlying case comes out of state court. And it's in federal court because it comes up on a federal habeas petition. It's an underlying state criminal case. And the criminal defendant in state court was charged with abducting a seven-year-old girl, sexually abusing her, and throwing her into a river, leaving her to drown. And so he then goes to trial on those horrendous charges in state court, and the trial judge in state court, and this is a quote from the opinion, 
in his early teens had been subjected to coercive but not forcible sexual abuse by his father. The abuse had not involved penetration of any kind. The judge said that he had no lasting scars from the experience that would interfere with his ability to decide sex offense cases fairly. So this then, the, and then so the, the court denied the bias charge. It's brought up in federal court on a habeas in a 1983 claim challenging the constitutionality of that, saying that he was biased against me by definition under those by perception of bias standards because of his background. And so the Eighth Circuit rejects that charge, and here's the holding. It says, quote, we acknowledge that childhood sexual abuse often has lasting psychological effects. We have no reason to believe that a person would be immune from those effects simply because he or she grows up to be a judge rather than an accountant or a taxi driver. After consideration, however, we think it is not generally true that a judge who was a victim of sexual abuse at some time in the remote past would therefore probably be unable to give a fair trial to anyone accused of a sex crime. So you can see between the last case on the religion case and this case, courts having a very stringent line about what is the perception of bias and how far you have to be to justify the conclusion that a reasonable observer would um, perceive and presume bias in the, in the judge's decision-making um, realm because they happen to be a member of a group or have had a similar experience to someone on the stand. And there's obviously massive policy reasons that underlie this, and both opinions get into them. I mean, judges, you know, just as every citizen can have been a victim of crime, does that mean they can never decide a criminal case involving victims of crime? I mean, so the, the policy discussion is obviously fascinating and broad and debatable, of course, but that's where the courts generally come down on this bias question. So now let's go to our last case, which is <clears throat> United States versus TUI, 448 F3rd 542. This one comes out of the Second Circuit. And here you have um, a criminal defendant who the judge knew had been um, friends with, with the guy, and the guy got convicted and the judge sentenced him to probation. Um, and then that goes up on appeal to the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit vacates um, the sentence of probation in part because, um, you know, the, the relationship between the judge and the witness and, and sends the case back. And part of the quote that happens, um, and this came from the judge when he was dealing with the sentencing was that, on, on a subsequent sentencing, was that, um, those first two sentences that I gave you really go back to a lot of the relationship that you and I had when I was practicing law. You were a great friend, a good guy, and you bent over backwards, and I apologize to the prosecution. I really bent over backwards on your behalf in that regard. That explains those two sentences. And so the judge the third time out says, yeah, I really went light on you and gave you probation and no custodial sentence because you're a good guy. I knew you from back in the day. It's really terrible what's happened to you. In any event, you can imagine, not surprisingly, the Second Circuit said, no way. Um, that is bias on the face of the record, um, and that really should have been sent to a, to a new judge. Um, and so that was the conclusion. That fact pattern makes out a claim of bias. You know, there can be a whole bunch of other wrinkles that may occur in the case, but that alone is bias. So let's go to the next major scenario we're looking at, which is the judge's prior relationship with an actual witness. Um, and the general rule is that an acquaintance or familiarity with a witness just does not mandate that a judge be disqualified for bias. And so let's look at the case study is Fletcher versus Kanako um, Pipeline, 323 F3rd 661. This is coming out of the Eighth Circuit in 2003. And the basic situation is that judge, um, ha, you know, was friends with a fact witness, and the fact witness in that case happened to be a lawyer, um, and the case itself was a commercial um, dispute um, battle, you know, in, you know, um, that was going on. And the judge happened to know one of the fact witnesses who happened to be a lawyer, and he'd known him for 36 years. It's not surprising the judge knew him because the judge had been a lawyer, and the fact witness was a lawyer. Um, it also turned out that that lawyer, who was the witness in the case, belonged to you know law firm X. And the judge actually retained Law Firm X, a different lawyer in Law Firm X, but just did retain Law Firm X on some current unrelated matters that the judge was getting legal help on. Um, so in any event, um, the court held that that did not overcome the presumption that the judge was impartial and that there was no need to disqualify. There just simply was not bias on those facts. Um, just because the judge had you know, been a friend of a fact witness that was appearing, not a party, a fact witness, and also used that fact witness's law firm for business. 
Um, now, that is a case, case that's very close to the line, and you could easily see another jurisdiction going the other way on those facts, um, in part because the judge had a financial relationship with the fact witnesses' um, law firm, and, and their, you know, the public perception that there could be bias because of that financial relationship could, could arguably be seen the other way. And so I think that case is at the very, very outer limits of what could be acceptable and may go another way in another jurisdiction. And that's why I have down here a but C citation to another case coming out of the 11th Circuit where there was a defense witness and where the judge said, yikes, you know, I know that witness and I even have some concerns about whether my partiality could be perfectly preserved or could be perceived to not be perfectly preserved, even if I'm doing a good job. And so the, that case held the very fact that the judge herself had some, um, himself had some um, bias perception questions should have mandated um, disqualification for bias. And so there's a good example of, you know, the seesaw of two cases on either side of that one that can go different ways when it comes to witness relationships. And so one of the practice pointers, if you're dealing with a situation like this that you really want to get to the bottom of, is not is the depth of the relationship with a witness and the ties to the witness, but also what was important is what is the role of that witness in the underlying case as opposed to, you know, is it a massive witness, you know, like a huge defense witness that could turn the case? Or is it just some bit player witness on some minor issue at summary judgment that's not really dispositive of anything in the case and you know, does it really matter type thing? That is a very important part of the analysis that courts re require you to look at and assess. So let's go to the third scenario. And now we're gonna get closer to home for us as practicing lawyers and that is a judge's relationship with an attorney. Um, and the general rule again here you can see is that an acquaintance or familiarity with a lawyer does not require disqualification for bias as a general matter. It really depends upon the actual level of intimacy and so it's a very fact-intensive inquiry. Close friends um, between a lawyer and a judge, you know, it, it can exist that you can have a close friend and that does not always require bias but situationally it could require if there's too much enmeshment given a particular fact pattern. And this is a fascinating case coming out of the Seventh Circuit, United States versus Murphy, um, that involved um, you know, a, a claim of bias gets brought up. And the facts really are pretty actually remarkable. You have a situation where the prosecutor in the case is very close, good, you know, close friends with the judge. And that's not shocking, obviously, because many federal judges were former prosecutors and they go become a judge and then their old friends in the prosecutor's office are still practicing law. They have the right to practice law. And, they're appearing before the judge. It's, it's completely normal, obviously. Um, this case, interestingly, you know, it was a political corruption trial, <laughs> which makes it particularly ironic, probably, in terms of how the facts unfolded. But Murphy's on trial for political corruption, and he doesn't know that the judge is a close friend of the prosecutor. Um, and in fact, um, you know, what happened then is, you know, the trial occurs. You know, prosecution puts on its case, defense puts on its case, and the defendant gets convicted. And upon, you know, literally on the heels of conviction, the prosecutor and the judge go off together on a family vacation, which was a pre-planned family vacation that had been scheduled. And so the trial's ending and they all pack up their, their bags for their, you know, Christmas ski vacation or whatever it was. The defense didn't know about that, that vacation. The judge returns, prosecutor returns, um, and the sentence is then imposed on the defendant. Eventually the facts come out, it's not really clear how, about all of this. Um, and what comes out also on the rec uh, in the motion that Sam brought saying this is bias and this is, this is unacceptable is that not only were they friends, they were best of friends. And, you know, the, it should have been disclosed that there was a vacation planned. Um, and so this then goes up to the Seventh Circuit and the, se the Seventh Circuit says, look, that level of friendship is unusual. It's not just we're, we're friends, we get together once in a while, we're, you know, either like social friends at bar events or even legitimate friends where you know we, our families have dinner together and whatnot but it's the, the the seventh circuit said it's an unusually close friendship i mean they were best of friends um and so under an objective test the perception of bias would definitely be present there um in terms of the fairness of it and so um the court concluded ultimately that 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 was bias that would require a judge to sort of step aside or notify people and, and not proceed with what they were doing. Ironically or sadly as it could be the case for the defendant, you know, all these cases get complicated by all the procedural machinations that go on and even though the court said the judge was, was biased and that should have been disclosed and that triggered the objective um, appearance of bias standard, 
they found some other you know, legal, legal shenanigans, you could call it, or loopholes or whatnot that are outside the scope of this program to say, well, you know, your lawyers knew enough to say something and should have said something and they didn't say it soon enough and so they've waived and forfeited and blah, blah, blah. And so even though he was biased um, in a political corruption trial for what could be perceived as personal corruption, um, the defendant went to jail and the judge was okay and the case went on. Um, so let's now move to the fourth scenario, which is when you have judges in, involved in commentary on public issues. And this is somewhat similar to our first scenario of, ex, of experiential situations, but it's not built entirely upon the same foundation. And so this is more where a judge is involved in public commentary on issues. And judges, of course, they don't shed their First Amendment rights when they become judges. And they speak to reporters on a variety of issues, depending upon, you know, why journalists may call them for general comments, or they know journalists, or they even get asked to be on TV sometimes as a speaking head, maybe on CNN on a panel, right? And so, you know, you don't see it all the time, but you do see it sometimes. And so the general rule here is that an unusual level of judicial public commentary can require disqualification for bias. But if a judge is engaging in some sort of balanced set of public statements, that doesn't demonstrate or require a finding of bias. And so there's a couple of good cases that we can look at to see either side of this really important fault line so that you as a lawyer can know when you're safe charging bias and you as a lawyer can know when you're not safe charging bias. Um, let's look at the first one. United States versus Cooley, 1F3, 985. This is coming out of the Tenth Circuit in 1993. And here the situation was as follows. The judge had actually been on television, this is before the case, had been on television to address abortion protests and publicly said that these protests were illegal. Um, and this was at a time when, you know, there were massive protests in that local geography, you know, um, in the Tenth Circuit going on about, you know, anti-abortion protests or protesting Planned Parenthood or whatever the protests were. Um, but in any event, those protests are going on. It's a matter of public interest, public concern, public curiosity. And, you know, the judge ends up going on TV as just a commentator to talk about, you know, the rights of protesters to protest or not protest and whatnot. In any event, the judge's conclusion was, as he said on TV, the protests were legal. Then eventually, a case is then brought um, involving a prosecution against some of the protesters, and it goes to the judge, and the judge, the judge refused to disqualify upon motion. Um, and this then goes up on appeal, <clears throat> and the Tenth Circuit concludes that, and this is a quote, together, these mistakes unmistakably conveyed an uncommon interest and degree of personal involvement in the subject matter. It was an unusual thing for a judge to do, and it unavoidably created the appearance that the judge had become an active participant in bringing law and order to bear on the protesters, rather than remaining as a detached adjudicator. So as you can see, that's obviously a conclusion that that's a pretty significant level of enmeshment of predetermination and conclusion about a case, and so there you have bias. Now, we can also look at the other side of that fault line, and the other side of that fault line is another case, this is also from 1993, interestingly, and this is from the Second Circuit, and this is United States versus Patera, and it's at 5 F3rd 624, and so Patera is a defendant on trial in a, in a, drug, in a drug case, and Patera brings a bias challenge to the judge, saying the judge should be disqualified because the judge, you know, was in favor of the prosecution and against the defendant. And the basis for that charge in terms of the facts, and again, note here, just as with the abortion um, case, these are extra judicial facts coming outside the record. But the charge here is that, look, the judge went off and gave a lecture at some point in the past to the DEA and to prosecutors on steps to take to increase the prospect of getting convictions in their narco cases. <clears throat> and, and was unhappy about it, saying that the judge, look, they're biased, they're helping the prosecution and whatnot. <clears throat> now the court analyzed the specific of the facts of that lecture and said, no, that's a judge involved in really continuing education programs talking about if you want to successfully prosecute a narco case, these are the steps you can take. And the judge in that program was balanced. The judge criticized um, prosecutors for things they do wrong. And also the judge spoke on other programs to other panels and spoke to criminal defense lawyers on the same types of issues. And so the court said, that is an example where there's no bias. That's not an, an, 
undue level of enmeshment in the issues of narco prosecutions and drug prosecution um, crimes and how-tos and, and whatnot. It's not an undue level like the abortion case. This is sort of an example of balanced public statements where really the judge is just giving general legal advice to all sides um, of, you know, of the, the table and to the people on each side of the proverbial V, the prosecution and the defense. And those types of balanced educational programs um, and commentaries are not enough to trigger a conclusion of bias. So here we are now in scenario five. And, and this is the big picture umbrella question of lawyers in terms of their behavior and charging bias. And so the distillation of the lessons that we've now looked at are this general rule that we see here. A party cannot force, and specifically a lawyer representing their party, but a party cannot force disqualification for bias by attacking the judge within the four corners of the case and then claiming that those attacks must have caused the judge to be biased. That type of strategic behavior designed to trigger bias feelings and then disqualification motions won't work. Indeed, it'll boomerang. Um, and so the important point here that you do want to remember constantly is the feelings of frustration within your case, those feelings of the judge doesn't get it, the judge doesn't like my client, I'm losing all the rulings, it's not fair, you get to evidence, you're being curtailed and hamstrung in terms of what you're doing. All of those conclusions and feelings you have about how the, this judge is biased from, from what's going on within the case are ones that you have to be very, very careful about ever teeing up in a bias motion because those come from within the four corners of the record and those rarely can be a basis to justify a bias finding. And so what they do is they boomerang on you and they create problems for you in the sense that you make an unfounded charge, you lose, who knows, you probably have upset your judge now, you've certainly upset your client and you're, you've potentially damaged your client's situation. And so that requires very careful, you know, nuanced balancing. We saw it, for example, in the Harry Bridges case with Vance Hellenin, who part of his charge was intra-record um, charges about the judge being unfair. And so the policy that underlies this, and this comes from the U.S. Supreme Court, the circuit courts have said it, state courts have said it too, but the, the, the massive policy that this sits underneath, that's, that's animating and motivating this, this d refusal to allow lawyers to, to create bias from within the, the four corners of their case, are that if the judge is making bad rulings against you, you have a remedy, it's an appeal. And so, for example, Vince Helen, you didn't like your opening statement being curtailed, you didn't like the evidentiary rulings, you didn't like the fact that your defense was carved up and shut down and it was an important defense. Well, if the judge was wrong, you can take that up on appeal. You can't fight with the judge, violate the judge's rules, keep doing what you do, and then when you get in trouble, say the judge is biased and expect the judge to recuse himself, right? I mean, that policy doesn't work for the orderly administration of justice. And so that headwind, that standard, is what mandates that the goings on within a trial record, you take up on appeal, and it's very rare that they can be the basis for bias. It's not impossible, because as we get ready to turn to race, we're gonna see some intra-record comments from judges um, that justify race-based um, bias charges against a judge. Now the flip side before we move to race of course is this last bullet point on this slide and that is that complementary public statements by lawyers about judges do not require recusal. And so this is really important to keep in mind. If I, Peter, as a lawyer have made some complementary statement about Judge X you know, and it's been published in a newspaper article, you know, when, you know, you know, there's some big case and Judge X decides something and they always get, you know, lawyers to give a quote here and there and they say, you know, local lawyer Peter said, Judge X's decision showed, you know, great wisdom and he was a great judge and that's been my experience, he's always a great judge. I mean, whatever, you make it up, write a quote like that. Then I'm later on appearing before that judge, um, Judge X, in some completely unrelated case and you're my opposing counsel and you say, oh my gosh, you know, you need to recuse yourself for bias, Judge, because Peter has said you're a great judge and now you're going to be biased in favor of Peter and against me. That's not going to work. Um, judges are not deemed biased because lawyers happen to have said positive or negative things about the judge in the press. Um, again, very, very fact specific and it would take an extreme case to get over that hurdle. This brings us to race and the issue of bias that comes up as we look at this through the race prism now. 
and we've looked at the other prisms, but now we're on, we're on race. And so the general rule is that charging race as a bias to bounce a judge requires really powerful evidence. And so the good case study here is a case coming out of the Second Circuit, and this case is called McDraw Inc. versus CIT Group Equipment Financing Inc. And all you need to know about that case is what you see in the title, which is it's obviously a commercial case. It was some commercial financing battle between two parties in a commercial dispute over a commercial contract. And the case was then assigned in the Southern District of New York to, to Judge Chin, who was um, a federal district judge there appointed by President Clinton. Now, he's just presiding over this case. The plaintiff's lawyers in the McGraw case happened to be involved in a completely separate piece of litigation. And this was a high profile case where they had, it was, a, it was a sort of a big piece of political campaign finance corruption case. And for someone else, for another client, they were suing the, the President Clinton administration saying that there was campaign finance fraud going on related to some Asian camp campaign finance funding that had been done. Had nothing to do with Judge Chin. But those plaintiff's lawyers said, well, and this is where they were sitting in a room isn't creating their own dangerous echo chamber. They sat in a room and said, well, we are charging the Clinton administration with campaign finance fraud related to Asian political donations. Our judge is an Asian American judge who was appointed by President Clinton. So let's go in and say that he cannot be balanced and, and he, is, he must be biased against us because he was appointed by President Clinton and we're accusing President Clinton's administration in another case that he's not even the judge in of some bad stuff, right? You can already see the dangerous echo chamber they were in. In any event, they did it. They launched that assault on Judge Chin and it was decided by the Southern District of New York that there was no basis for disqualification. And in fact, they went further and said, quote, it is intolerable for a litigant without any factual basis to suggest that a judge cannot be impartial because of his or her race and political background. And so it was a beetle, a brutal beat down on those lawyers. I mean, it's, it's a couple opinions well worth reading coming from the Second Circuit in terms of the absolute danger of dabbling in race charges against people like that. Now, let's look at um, bias on the other side of this, where you have the judge actually involving race in the decisional process and commentary on race where bias can be triggered. And we're going to look at a couple cases now. The first one is in Ray Chevron, and this comes out of the Fifth Circuit, and it's a mass tort claim brought by predominantly black neighborhoods against Chevron. And the federal judge assigned to the case was a black judge, and he made sarcastic comments about the race of the experts being Caucasian, and he rejected their expert studies. The plaintiff in the case, the plaintiff community and the judge said, look, I was just being sarcastic. But the Fifth Circuit rejected it and said that those statements and comments were unfortunate, they were inappropriate, and they required real scrutiny, and that it's simply unacceptable for a federal judge, irrespective of color, to, you know, make racially insensitive statements or even casual comments during the course of the proceeding. So basically, even if it wasn't racist per se, just joking, laughing, sarcastic, whatever it may be, it's, it's just off grounds. You can't do it. Not a place to go. The final case is, again, a bias case, and this involves um, criminal prosecution against a Hispanic defendant. The Hispanic defendant pled guilty. He moved to change the plea, and the judge was frustrated. And the judge says, I won't put up with this from these Hispanics or anybody else, any other defendants. I've got other cases involving a Hispanic defendant who came in here and told me he understood what was going on, everything was fine, and now he can't speak English because he was trying to get out of his sentence saying he didn't understand his plea deal. And there, um, the Tenth Circuit said, look, that requires disqualification. I mean, whether the person was lying or not about understanding what was going on, it's just simply not okay for a judge to go over the line and start talking about this thing going on from Hispanics. And so there again, the use of race in that way, not good. That brings us to our conclusions today. Um, the bias standards, remember, are built around the reasonable observer perception standard not being met. It's a very high standard, not easy to meet. You need to be very careful as a lawyer making a charge. Race, race cases really trip lines faster, and the moment you have judicial comment um, you know, using race in some way, there really may be problems. And then let's go back as, a, as we pause here and conclude this program to Harry Bridges, because remember, he then went to a fourth trial. I told you he won his third trial at the Supreme Court. They sent it back. The federal government now prosecuted him in a civil denaturalization trial, still trying to get, get him out of the country, and that went to trial in 1955. And 
you know, 20 years now in four trials and serial deportation um, proceedings. And I won't make you buy my book to know what happens. I'll give you the answer now. And that is he eventually finally won that case and the government gave up in 1955. But you want to see an example of the lawyer Boomerang? Who was his lawyer in that fourth case? It wasn't Vince Hallen and he hired someone else. So that's the perfect example of um, the lawyer Boomerang at work in terms of the danger of getting in the face of a judge. Thank you very much for watching this presentation today.